and here we are on blood. So this chapter in uh, OpenStax, it's chapter 18, 18, 19, and 20. Blood, heart, blood vessels, that is all part of... Um, <clears throat> that's all part of cardiovascular, the cardiovascular system. Probably the most important system out of this um, semester, right? Not that any one system is more important than the others, but if you see what you deal with the most, it's going to be cardiovascular. So cardiovascular system is made from the heart and the blood and then the, um, the blood vessels. So that makes up cardiovascular system. So we're going to spend a good deal of time on it, um, probably a couple of weeks. Um, and we'll start with blood, which is kind of the easier of the two. Um, so there's blood, right? So blood, blood's a water-based, um, it's, it's actually considered a connective tissue. So a couple of things about blood um, that I didn't, that I didn't put in the um, PowerPoint. Blood has a pH of about 7.4. Not about. Blood has a pH of 7.4. So there's not much of a variance in that pH. You can be 7.35, 7.45. Beyond that, it's 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 alkalosis or it's acidotic it's it's so 7.3 is is acidic it's acidic blood and your body will start to uh, react to that you know 7.5 even though it's, it's close to 7.4 it doesn't matter this it's 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 too alkaline it's too basic so your blood has a pH, you know, it's, it's pH is 7.4, a little bit, you know, not quite neutral. Um, you have about four to five liters of blood in your body. So everything's done with liters and just to, you know, you can picture in your head a two liter bottle of soda or a water bottle. A water bottle is half a liter or about 500 milliliters. So you should have that in your head. You know, you should have an idea in your head if somebody says half a liter or 500 mils, you should put in your head what that is. That's about a water bottle, you know, a standard bottle of water. So um, we have about four to five liters. So there you go. Um, Men tip tend to have a little bit more blood, so closer to, to the, the, the five, women closer to four. And then um, a lab test will, um, we'll, we'll get to that. So about 55% or so of your blood is plasma. And, and plasma is essentially water, right? So about 55% of your blood is plasma and about 45% of your blood is um, what we call formed elements. That's what these are down here. So this stuff up here in yellowish, cream, off-white color, that's um, plasma. And then the stuff underneath is the um, formed elements. Oh, it's labeled formed elements. There you go, formed elements. So you see formed elements are about 45%. Again. A little bit more in men, a little bit less in women. Um, so a, a measurement of this is called hematocrit. So if you ever get like a like blood work done on you, you'll see you might see that hematocrit, and so it should be around 45, right? 40, 46, 47 for men, maybe 43 for women, not 30, not 40, not 38. You know it's. That's another thing, you know, these, there's always a range in 
on these labs, that doesn't mean that if you've got one thing outside of the range that you're going to die. You know, so hematocrit is 45, right? And so they'll have a range, whatever. Every lab has a different range. So we'll say, we'll say um, 42 to 48, right? Just to make up a number. That doesn't mean 49, okay, something's wrong, right? Maybe you were dehydrated. If you're dehydrated, you have less water in your body. So if you look up here, you see that plasma is mostly water. So if you're dehydrated, you you don't have as much plasma. That means that the percentages are going to go off, right? The plasma is going to be not 55%. It's going to be lower, and that makes your formed elements higher. So your hematocrit is going to read higher. It might read higher because you're dehydrated. But anyway, it's it's you know it's an it's an idea. So um, hematocrit levels somewhere around forty five. Um, the temperature of your blood is a little bit a little bit warmer than we are. So our temperature is thirty seven. We do it all in Celsius. So we're thirty seven degrees. Our blood's about thirty eight. It's not like a huge deal, but I mean. So, um, four to five liters, about 38 degrees, 7.4 pH. It's about 55% plasma, 45% formed elements. And if you go look at the plasma, you see that mostly plasma is about 92% water. So it's mostly water. There is some gases and electrolytes in there, a little bit, of, you know, there's some carbon dioxide in there, a little bit of oxygen, you know, we transport oxygen through plasma, but not really, it's not like that big of a deal. But besides water, the main thing is plasma proteins. And I wrote the three plasma proteins right there. So I want you to know them. These are three, these are three, the main three proteins that are found in your plasma, and this is what they do. So fibrinogen is going to be, that is like an inactive clot. So again, same thing here, same thing as with um, angiotensinogen. When you take off the O-G-E-N, that's the active thing active enzyme so fibrin is what makes clots like blood clots fibrinogen is inactive because it ends with o-g-e-n so that's in your blood right now it's inactive globulins you might have heard of like immunoglobulins um, so those are proteins that are involved in immunity that's in a later chapter And albumin. Albumin is a protein that is, well, we use it, we use it primarily to move water in and out of capillaries. So when you put, when you want to put water into the interstitial fluid, you can use albu albumin. Just like water follows sodium. So wherever sodium is, water wants to go where it is. Same thing with albumin. So our body uses albumin to push around water in our body. Those are three plasma proteins. So that's plasma. It's, it's essentially mostly water. There are some plasma proteins. That's what are. It's not the only thing in plasma, but yeah, it makes most of it. Then you have formed elements. You have red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. So those are the three things that make the formed elements. 
they kind of got them all in here. All right, and, and the slides that we were looking at in lab, all the red blood cells are like pink, like pink circles. And then if you looked at the blood cells, you saw some, um, some purple, dark blue, dark blue things. Those are the white blood cells. So red blood cells look like this. We call them a biconcave disc. Biconcave meaning like, you know, it's like how it's like a depression here. And there's one like that on the other side. It's not a big deal, but <clears throat> they mainly carry oxygen, right? Blood, red blood cells carry oxygen. And we're actually not going to call them red blood cells. Um, although, you know what? People do, they do abbreviate it and they'll say RBC. But a more, a more appropriate and common word would be erythrocytes. Which right here. So erythrocytes are red blood cells. And you notice that. If you look up a little bit, it's saying nucleus ejected. So red blood cells don't actually have a nucleus, which means they don't have a nucleus. It means they can't go through mitosis. They can't split into more cells. So they're different than they're different than the other cells in our body. If you take something like liver cells or skin cells one cell will split into two those will split into four and it just keeps growing like that right that's what the whole chapter on the cell cycle was in in biology but not the case here that means that these cells have to be made constantly so red blood cells have to be constantly made and they are made in as all these cells are, they're made in the red bone marrow. So blood cells are made in the red bone marrow. That's kind of like the middle of your bone, right? Not all bones. Long bones, like your humerus or um, the tibia, something like that. Right? They're not made in like your wrist bones or anything like that. Long bones. Some of your flat bones, like your sternum, that's what you find um, red bone marrow. So they're made in your red bone marrow. And I've got this circled in red up here. So I'm just showing you kind of like the lineage. And you see I crossed out a lot of stuff because I didn't want to just go over it. You know, I didn't want you to have to learn a bunch of stuff that I think you won't necessarily see again. But when you follow the lineage, you have pluripotent stem cells. Pluripotent stem cells can become like any type of cell. And actually, if you follow this down, this pluripotent stem cell, you see one arrow is going to something called myeloid stem cell. And then the other arrow is going to lymphoid stem cell. So when you look at it that way, you see all these cells here at the bottom, they're all, they all have the same ancestry, except for these two at the end, the lymphocytes. They're kind of different, right? And we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to the chapter on immunity. But my point here is that I've got this thing circled in blue here. It says pro-erythroblast. Pro just means like a precursor. So it's like a precursor to a red blood cell. And then you see here in blue, I've, I've said that this chemical erythro, it's a hormone, erythropoietin. Erythropoietin increases these pro-erythroblasts. Or we could say, I mean, there's a better way to say it, or like an easier way. Erythropoietin increases red blood cells. So this is a 
hormone that we can actually give in like a hospital setting, which is common. It's common to give it. You'll see it. They call it, there's, a, there's two out there, and I always forget what the other one's called, but one of them's called epigen. This is what, um, this is what, when they, when they talk about like doping in sports, this is what they're doing. They're taking like epigen, and so they'll make more red blood cells, which means that, you know, what do red blood cells do? They carry oxygen. So now you've increased your oxygen carrying capacity. So that could give you an advantage. So now you're delivering oxygen to your cell, to your muscle cells better, to different places in your body. So if you have like a low hematocrit, they can try to give you this to stimulate um, red blood cell formation. And I wrote another one here. That's kind of hard to see. That looks like a V, but it's the same word, P-O-I-E-T-I-N, except erythro means red. Thrombo means like platelets or clotting. If you see the word thrombo, T-H-R-O-M-B-O, -O, you think something about platelets or clotting, something like that like thrombosis, like deep vein thrombosis, right? It's got that word thrombo in it. So thrombopoietin will increase platelets. <coughs> I forgot what that one's called. But let's go back to the red blood cells because right, right now we're on the red blood cells. So erythropoietin will increase it. Here's red blood cells. Red blood cells are essentially... <coughs> Masses of hemoglobin. That would have helped me if I had this up. I don't know if you were able to. Did you get notes on that? No, I didn't. It's on page two. So, hemoglobin is just. You know, red blood cells are essentially just masses of hemoglobin. I've made a, an error up here. Not that I'm going to ask you, but I put around 280 hemoglobin molecules. I meant 280 million hemoglobin molecules for each, each red blood cell. <clears throat> I'm looking that up as I'm telling you. Feeling not feeling good about what I said. How many hemoglobin? Good thing I'm not recording this. Oh, people have already asked it. 270 million. That's off by 10. According to Lumen Learning. But I'm sure if I look around, I'll find somebody that 270. I'll find someone that agrees with me. 250, wow. Well, you get the idea, right? I mean, 300, who really counts when you get that high? Um, people with a lot of money count when they get that high. For me, I'd be like, uh, 280 million, 270 million. It's all good. It's all more than I can spend. The people that have that much money, they count it. So they're strangled by what they have. 280 million, uh, somewhere, who cares? I'm not going to ask you, right? A lot of hemoglobin. So what's hemoglobin made from? I put it here. It's heme and globin. So heme is made from a pigment. It's just a, you know, pigment is like a color. It's like this, like a paint, like paint is a pigment, right? So heme is pigment and iron. It's like a pigment and iron complex. Globin is just a, a protein. Probably going to 
going to wrap up around 10.45 today, just to give you a heads up. So uh, I'm going to go back to this. Uh, that doesn't look any better, does it? All right. <laughs> so red blood cells are made. They live, they, they're made in your red bone marrow. They live a certain life span, and then they die. So they live for about four months. So red blood cells are erythrocytes. I was being lazy. Erythrocytes are made in the red bone marrow. They live for about four months. Then I, you see what I wrote here? I said phagocytized. That's a good word to know. Phago means eat. Cyte, C-Y-T-E. We've been using this erythrocyte, leukocyte, thrombocyte, osteocyte, phagocyte, cell. Cyte means cell. Phagocyte is a cell that eats other things. We're going to talk about that few times in the semester. We're using it here as a verb, just like what people do. But really, a phagocyte is a type of cell that's in your body that eats other things. It could be like it's, it's, a, it's a real good part of your immune system. Like when you, when you eat something that you shouldn't, like a piece of bacteria, or if you inhale a piece of pollen, they're going to be phagocytized. It's not going to be an issue, right? You, you, you ate bacteria that you shouldn't have eaten already today. And um, the phagocytes went and phagocytized them, you know, ate them, took care of your problem. So you should know what phagocytes are. Here, um, here these phagocytes specialize in eating up old red blood cells. So your liver and your spleen is what does this. Your spleen, um, your spleen does it, but it kind of transfers some of its duties to the liver eventually. So you could look at the spleen as like a helper for the liver. You could live without your spleen. Can't live without your liver, though. Liver does a bunch of stuff. Here, your liver is eating up old red blood cells. <clears throat> so we got three parts of the red blood cell here that I'm talking about. It's the three bottom bullet points. Protein, iron, and pigment. So when you take hemoglobin, you've got heme and you've got globin. Globin's protein. So let's deal with that first. I already put. Proteins get recycled. They're going to be made into other proteins. We could take this globin out of the hemoglobin and make more hemoglobin. Or maybe you want to make bone or skin or muscles or antibodies or enzymes, whatever you want to make. It's That's what your body does with proteins. You don't... You don't really like pee it out or get rid of it. You try to make stuff with it. That's building material. I know I keep talking about it. I'm going to keep pressing the point home. Right? Protein's building material. You make stuff, everything that your body has. Right? So the answer is always easy when it comes to proteins. What's going to happen to the protein if we're not going to use something anymore? It's going to get recycled. So that's what happens here. Globin gets recycled. Now we're left with heme. Heme has two parts, iron, pigment. The iron we can recycle. Your body does that. Your body recycles iron. The pigment, no, you're not going to recycle it. You've got to get rid of it. That's coloring, right? That's part of my skin color or lack of, right? You're seeing lack of pigment in my skin cells and 
you're seeing some red come out. That's actually, that's from your blood. It's like, you know, seeing through my translucent skin. And like whenever you see red in like pasty white people, that's their, yeah, that's their, their um, that's like their bloodstream. How do we get on top of everything? I don't know. With our lack of pigment. Um, so what happens to the iron? Let's talk about the iron. So you see, I wrote this word transferrin, right? So the first thing that's going to happen is that this protein called transferrin, the word tells you trans means transport F E R R. When you see F E R R in a word, it means iron, something to do with iron. So already this word, I already know what it is. I don't have to know anything. F-E-R-R -R means iron, trans, transport. Oh, it transports iron. And usually when it ends with I-N, that's going to tell me it's a protein, right? So transferrin, it's a protein that transfers iron. So that's what it does. Transferrin comes in, picks up the iron, and it takes it to a temporary storage place called ferritin. It's like another protein. So ferritin is like a temporary holding site for iron. Because you're getting iron from your, your, dye, your dying red blood cells, but you're also getting iron from food. So like, where's that iron going? They're going to take that iron and they're going to store it in, in ferritin. So iron's collecting from ferritin, I mean from um, food, iron's collecting from like old red blood cells and storing it in ferritin. And once you get like a good amount, then the transferrin will come back, like another transferrin will come back, pick up the whole thing and take it to your red bone marrow. Because that's where red blood cells are made. So we're going to take all that iron back to the red bone marrow to make some more red blood cells. So iron's getting recycled. Of course, we get iron from food too. So you're going to add the iron from the food and recycle the iron. And that's what happens to iron. So what happens to the protein? That's easy. What happens to the iron? It's a little bit harder, but it's kind of easy. Transferrin comes, grabs it, stores it in ferritin for a bit, then pick it up again and take it to the red bone marrow. The pigment goes through a series of changes. It degrades. So the, the color of blood's red. We're going to degrade that color. So it gets turned into, um, gets turned into kind of like a greenish pigment called biliveridin which I didn't put here. And then that's going to get degraded a bit into an enzyme called bilirubin. So now we're kind of in the liver. Like we're still in the liver. That's where it's all getting broken down, right? So bilirubin is next. Now from the liver, it's going to be incorporated into this thing called bile. Bile is used to like break down fats. So from your liver, stuff goes into your intestines. There's like a connection between your liver and your intestine. There's like a tube going from your liver to your intestine. So what goes from your liver into your intestine? This stuff called bile. And inside this bile, if you look at the color of bile, it's like a greenish color. It's this pigment that used to be your, um, used to be your blood. So it goes in, it turns into bilirubin. Then it turns into something called urobilinogen. Some of that urobilinogen is going to stay in your intestine and it's going to go out with your feces. It's going to turn into like a brown color. And it's going to, that's what stercobalin is. Some of that urobilinogen is going to go to your kidneys instead. 
and it's going to be a yellow pigment called urobilin. That's going to color. So the brown color of your feces and the yellow color of your urine, that's waste pigment from your blood. That's why, you know, why is your urine not blue or clear? Well, it's clear sometimes, but, you know, like, why is it yellowish? You know, why is your feces not, I don't know, whatever, purple, right? So the answer is, that alarm's probably telling me I have to end class. The answer is that it comes from your your blood. Um, I'm going to, and that's what this thing's showing you. I'm probably, I'm thinking I'm going to not, I'm debating right now whether I should put blood on the test or not, on the exam. It's like if you don't have it on the exam one, you're going to end up having it on, on exam two. Maybe I'll just give you guys an opportunity to, if I just put endocrine. Although this stuff's not that hard. All right, I think I'm just going to go with endocrine for your exam one. Um, so I, I'll roll this over into your quiz two. Yeah, that's fine. But, you know, that's what all this is. Like, if you follow the, here's the red blood cells. If you go up here and follow this arrow, globin, broken into amino acids. You don't need to see it. Um, recycled. I'll show it to you. If you look at the arrow underneath it, um, you've got heme, like the iron part, right? So heme gets. I don't know if seen that up there. Heme is iron and pigment. So the iron, transferrin picks it up, it gets stored as ferritin and then it's going to get taken to the red bone marrow. And then here's the pigment, biliverdin, bilirubin. And by the way, I'm telling you up here that bilirubin is a common lab test. You expect bilirubin to be at a, at a certain level. What if it's too high? Well, maybe you're breaking red blood cells down too fast. So you got to say, why? Why is your bilirubin raised? Were you doping, blood doping? making like taking too much epigen. Okay. That would be, I would expect it to be raised. You're making lots of red blood cells. You're going to be breaking them down, but for normal people, why is it elevated? Why are you breaking it down too fast? Especially if you find a lot of, um, Billy Rubin and you find low hematocrit. So you don't have enough red blood cells. Why? Because you're breaking them down too fast. So then, then you kind of know where to look at. Well, why is that happening? You know, you're anemic. There's different reasons to be anemic because maybe you're not making red blood cells enough. Or um, maybe you don't have enough iron in your diet because iron's a part of red blood cells, right? So maybe you don't have enough iron. Or maybe you have all that, but you're breaking your blood cells down too much. So anyway, um, Billy Rubin is something you'll see in the future. And then yeah, you can look at the chart. Um, I think I'm going to leave it at, unless, unless there's an overwhelming demand for me to put this on the exam, I'm inclined to just leave it off. Let me stop recording this.